Welcome, everyone. And uh, the title is uh, British Columbia History in Fragments, What Lies Beneath Our Feet. And uh, what you're seeing is my opening slide here is a pretty exciting project to me, and I think a lot of people, and it's the dredging of Esquimalt Harbor. And this is an ongoing project. And I just selected a few little uh, vignettes there of artifacts that have come up and that have come into the Royal BC Museum. And uh, each of those certainly have stories to tell. Um, and your opening, one of the opening lines uh, comments on the conference was, what does it mean to remember historic events and people? Um, I think a very powerful way is through the fragments, the bits and pieces that we leave behind. And uh, I always like James Dietz, who was considered one of the fathers of uh, historic archeology. span In one of his books, he titled it In Small Things Forgotten. And that's kind of like I, the way I like to see some of this material. They are the small things forgotten, but they tell a big story. Uh, that and... Uh, I love being a storyteller myself. So my talk today, I'm going to some of, give an overview of uh, some of the artifacts we have in the historic archaeology collection at the RBCM. Uh, this is stuff that really is seldom seen by the public. Uh, some of the issues around historic archaeology, and that includes uh, things like significance and who is it significant to. Uh, some of the challenges as a repository. And, uh, you know, when there are no written records, we need to rely on these fragments to tell the story. And uh, also, I want to kind of give some idea for people such as yourselves, uh, historians and, and heritage groups, uh, what you can contribute and how you, how you can add to this story, because... There are some issues around it. Historic archaeology. Uh, when I talk historic archaeology, I'm really meaning post the post-contact period. Uh, First Nations certainly had a rich history, so there's no way I'm. It's just basically the comment uh, that refers to that post-contact era. Um, the photos that I have, and I do re do rely on a lot of photos uh, throughout the talk. Um, are the ones I had uh, when the pandemic hit. Uh, this stuff that was on my laptop, stuff I was working on at the museum. Uh, it looks like I will, we will have access to some of this material very shortly. I had a meeting with the museum the other day and it looks like things, things are coming back. So let's move on to the next slide here. And I know we have done some of the acknowledgements, but I would like to personally acknowledge that I am on Lekwungen territory, the Songhees and Esquimalt people. In fact, I live uh, just a couple hundred meters from the historic Songhees village. I want to acknowledge some of the staff at the RBCM, especially uh, Dr. Genevieve Hill, and she's the acting curator of archaeology. Grant Keddy, who is now retired, uh, he was one of my mentors for many years, and we're still good friends. Certainly Paul Ferguson from the Modern History uh, Collection, he was the Collections Manager for Modern History, and support from Chris O'Connor and the RBCM Learning Team. And I want to give a special thank you to uh, Department of National Defense, uh, who have been amazing on this uh, Esquimalt Harbor uh, dredging and remediation, and especially Mike Bodman and his team. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I think Ron has covered it fairly well, so I don't need to spend too much time with that, but uh, I am a research associate at the Royal BC Museum. I certainly have a long-standing involvement with the Archaeological Society BC, Society for Historic Archaeology. I have retired status. Uh, my work at Millennia, my, earlier this spring, I was actually documenting the material from uh, Parks Canada. And they have a rule that if it is 40 years old, 
they want it documented. So some of the stuff on the Pacific Trail, uh, I could have thrown there as a teenager. I might have been documenting. Uh, I am a past employee of the uh, archaeology branch, archaeology or the Royal BC Museum uh, archaeology branch. I basically started there as uh, when they had a bioarchaeology section, uh, and I was finishing up university. Um, meeting Grant Kenny got me really interested in in the historic aspects. My work at Natural Resources Canada, I. Uh, I did a lot of ecological work. I do have, I'm a registered professional biologist, uh, retired status, but one of my favorite jobs, and it was the last five or six years at uh, Natural Resources Canada, I was documenting all their long-term historic research sites on a searchable database. And uh, it was work I really loved. And as I said, I have over four decades of uh, looking at historic material and, and identifying. As I said, I love to be a storyteller. So let's get on with some stories. And this slide has absolutely nothing to do with BC. It's all about me. I was living in Southern Ontario, about eight years old. We were living in a mid-Victorian uh, farmhouse. And I was a bit of a I think my parents figured I was a bit of a strange kid because rather than playing, you know, baseball and football, I was out looking for things no matter where. And I was happily digging holes in the garden looking for things. And I came up with this 1854 Upper Canada token. And I was over the moon. I have never stopped looking at my feet. So as I say, just one artifact can it spark the imagination. So we need to instill that in younger people, get their imagination going. And if an object will do it, all the better. So uh, let's look at some aspects of historic archaeology and uh, historic objects directly connect people to history. How we view history and the questions we ask change over time. And that can't be any, that that has changed dramatically over the last few years. Uh, what we have left behind can often enhance the written record. It can also challenge established histories or even lead to new discoveries. Individual artifacts can tell a story. And I have a number of individual artifacts that do tell stories. And how does the province of British Columbia uh, protect historic archaeology? Well, that, e, that will depend where it is. And I'm going to ask those questions in a minute and have a few slides. The uh, photo on the right, e, we took in 2016. Victoria was building a dog park. This was in uh, Victoria West Park. It was about 200 meters behind where the historic uh, Haida village, Haida camp would have been at Lime Bay. And on a, it was a Sunday, I noticed there was historic uh, shell midden, uh, First Nations shell midden, very similar to a lot of the other sites we saw in the Sanghi's uh, historic village area. And we did some collection. It was interesting because uh, I contacted the city and said, the, you guys have dug into this, you've you've got this archaeological site and the engineer got back to me the next morning and said well there's nothing on our map and a few hours later the site was gone so uh as i said it depends where it is uh so we're going to ask a question how many years before a wreck site is automatically protected and this is a photo i took a few years ago by sydney uh it is somebody's wrecked fishing boat it's just there as a as a filler amazingly enough uh it's only two years it is very we have very strong legislation in bc for uh for shipwrecks and plane wrecks and so two years uh, i have i guess you can, okay the my cursor here i i've got some of the uh download of of the uh heritage act there that shows that 
I was uh, in a conference, the, the sorts, the uh, Society for Historic Archaeology conference a couple of years ago in Seattle. And they were actually amazed at how strong our legislation was in this area. And uh, the photo on the right there is just uh, a marine artifact. It was uh, HMS Amphion that had struck a reef uh, on its way to Vancouver in 1889 as part of the hull. And it's uh, in Beacon Hill Park at the entrance uh, as, as a permanent exhibit there. So it's, it's a case where we we have some of these large artifacts we can we can use for public exhibits and and create some interest. So uh, now we ask the question: How many years before a terrestrial site is automatically protected? And the two photos here: one is uh, the photo that I showed you earlier uh, that was taken in Vic West Park of this historic uh, shell midden, and in about twenty minutes. Grant and I had collected uh, this tray full of artifacts that you see in the bottom right hand corner. And you can see there's a number of these uh, dark olive uh, called black glass bottles, typically discontinued from use by about 1870. There's bits and pieces of uh, fragments of transferware pottery, some other bottles. And interestingly enough, there's this little copper trade ring, which was quite interesting. So, terrestrial sites are automatically protected after 177 years. That's quite amazing. So they used the date 1846, and this was uh, written in 1972, that act. I'm not entirely sure why they settled on this date, but that's what it is. So any sites after that time uh, generally Developers are free to destroy those sites uh, with, with few exceptions. And um, I have it written there. So if this were written now, this, is, this was written 50 years ago. This, uh, so if it were written now, the equivalent date would be a 1896. And that would protect a lot of the sites in BC, historic sites. The photos I'm using there, uh, the Langford Farmhouse, uh, this was built in 1852, and it is the developer, this actually was 10 years ago, nothing has happened on site, but the developer wanted to tear it down or move it. And it was kind of neat in that uh, Colwood hired Stuart Stark, who was a, a heritage consultant, and he asked the ASBC to become involved. And now uh, we have a couple of other professional archeologists there, uh, Al Mackey and uh, Pete Dady. And we worked on that. And it's quite amazing what, when we tore up the floor, all the original bricks were still there from the, from the, from the milk house and uh, some of the features. That's uh, me in the corner there, sitting on my butt digging. And uh, this is how, the, the, on the far right, this is how the building looked probably in the 1950s. Uh, this roof you see here was put on by one of the more recent landowners and he turned it into a tool shed and poured a floor. And hopefully uh, I would love to see the site somehow preserved or at least the milk house preserved, but that's for another day. So issues with historic archeology span and determining what is significant? Um, the photo, both of these photos are from the historic Songhees village on the west side of uh, Johnson Street Bridge. And this was a site called Shutters, which was one particular building site that was in the area of the historic village. And the photo on the left shows you some of the issues. Uh, in 1911, the Songhees left. The, the land was purchased and in, industry moved in. So you've got this whole mountain of pipes and industrial material there that, you know, uh, you know, just would a repository want any of this stuff? No. So it's, it's one of the challenges in determining what's significant. Now, the photo on the right 
it's a very different story. And it's only about 20 or so meters from this first photo. And that's uh, Steve Thomas from the Esquimalt band. He was working on it. And this was uh, pretty much undisturbed uh, historic midden from the time of the village. And that becomes very, very uh, significant uh, to the Songhees and Esquimalt people because it represents the very first few decades of their contact with the Europeans and, and Asian people coming in. Um, this site actually uh, produced several thousand historic artifacts. It's, a, it's an amazing collection. And uh, it was only saved, and I think it's probably safe for me to say by now, um, I found a single bone all on this site that the heritage or archaeology branch determined it was probably before 1846, so pre-contact, and they insisted on an archaeological investigation. And it was an amazing story that produced it. We've got some amazing artifacts that came out of it. Some I'll, I'll show a little later. So the collection, um, when you're dealing with historic archaeology, how do you start to sort things? How do you categorize? Well, that's going to depend a lot on your research questions, uh, display needs, and even the type of site. Some examples of classifying glass and pottery containers, ceramics, metal objects, personal objects, organic perishable objects, objects related to marginalized ethnic groups, objects related to children, objects related to women. So there's an endless way to sort uh, this material when it's when it's being you know organized. And uh, the photo to the right is a photo. This is uh, Grant Keddy, who was the curator of archaeology at the time. And um, Point Ellis House did this archaeology day. So there's Grant with all his material organized in boxes and a uh, very interested family to the right there. Okay, let's, we're going to look at some of the types of things that you're going to find in BC sites, glass and ceramic bottles, they're, they're going to be, every, they're, they're what you're going to typically find. Uh, the most, they're the most common uh, items you're going to find. Um, and the neat thing with bottles, a, a lot of advancements were made in manufacturing methods during the 19th and 20th century. So we can date a lot of this material very specifically. Uh, the types of bottles can also offer a, a lot of insight into the lifestyles of the people there, the trade patterns of, of, of people who were using them. And uh, I have a note there, it, it, some of this glass will deteriorate in time. It, doesn't really relate to age. It relates to the quality of the glass and, and the conditions that's found in, especially material that comes out of salt water. It always comes up with a frosted look and that's just a natural deterioration. The photos on the right there, uh, there is this, the, this was the approach to Johnson Street Bridge. And I was looking at this material, looking at the ground and there was a, just one of these black glass bottles, the base sticking up. We have, uh, this is a tray of material that were found uh, around that area that we have at the museum. It was interesting. Um, we found hundreds of these broken glass, black glass bottles uh, in this area. Very few of them full. And it wasn't until Grant Keddy said, you know, they had the well there. And we have some photo photos that could could give us, you know, lead us in this line of thinking that they were probably gathering these bottles and filling them with fresh water for the uh, for the for the miners that, that were coming into Victoria. So it might have been a little bit of an industry going, and that might have explained why there were so many of these broken uh, bottles. So as I said, individual stories. Um, some of these bottles. It's, it's amazing. Uh, this was dug by Grant Keddy at what would have been the 
Haida camp uh, at the far end of the, the Songhees village, right, right by Spinnaker's, right next to Lime Bay. And he dug this in uh, 1983. And it's uh, an 1850s, 1860s style American soda bottle, pop bottle uh, from New York City, which is an interesting find here. And, but when we look at it, the California gold rush they were short of bottles. They were raiding bottles from Eastern uh, US companies and reusing them. So they were recycling. And then Victoria, during the gold rush, we were grabbing bottles from San Francisco, recycling them. And the really interesting thing about this bottle is these two scratched initials, AP. And I'll... Just like, now, we know from, we've seen this on multiple bottles. We, we have this well established. Uh, this was Alex Phillips. And he came to Victoria in 1858 from San Francisco. And he established the Pioneer uh, Syrup, Soto, and Cider Works the following year. He was born in London. Uh, he, emigrated to Australia, then to California in 1849, where he, instead of gold panning, he was uh, a baker, soda maker, soda water maker, and he brought his trade to Victoria um, with the gold rush. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'll just take a quick drink here. So once in Victoria, he became the president of Congregation Emmanuel, and he was the, one of the founders of the synagogue. He was both a member, the founder of them. He was Mason, uh, founded the, also founded the founder of the Odd Fellows, British Columbia Benevolent Society. So very prominent uh, figure in Victoria's history. The bottles on the bottom <clears throat> were all dredged from Esquimalt Harbor. All of these are rare items, by the way. Um, this is one of his ginger beers, A. Phillips Victoria. Uh, another one, A. Phillips Victoria, one of his glass bottles. Interestingly enough, these three all have A. Phillips and Son, and they date to about the 1880s, but he's still using the, the VI for the Crown Colony of Vancouver Island. So... It was interesting, he, he still retained that rather than the BC. And I found this, uh, this was in the Jewish Museum of American, of the American West, uh, one of his adverts, Alex Phillips, peppermint and ginger beer, Fort Street near Blanchard Street. And we know later on he was at the, basically the bottom of Yates Street right near Store Street. Uh, and a number of his things, one of our projects with the Johnson Street Bridge, I think there's a number of uh, siphon bottles that were, were found that were broken pieces that probably came from Alex Phillips. So another uh, project that produced a lot of bottles uh, in 1991, um, the Royal Jubilee Hospital was uh, building an extension and the, somebody from the hospital phoned Grant Keddy uh, at the museum and said, well, the workmen are packing up with all kinds of interesting stuff. So Grant organized the ASBC and uh, he volunteered to oversee it. And we found, it, we have an amazing collection from the site. And the interesting thing is we found that it dates between 1890 and 1893. So we have this window a three-year window where we're finding this material all related to the hospital. And the photo there uh, with, with some of the folks digging, you can see the old operating theater behind us there. And this is all now a Japanese garden. And uh, some of the people there working, uh, this person standing is myself, another fellow, John Schmogi, who has gone on his career in archaeology uh, with the uh, Bastion Group, he was working with us. And uh, the bottles there, 
um, are all Lian parents. We found oodles of them, and which told me that maybe they had to spice up the food. Um, also, a lot of these uh, capers bottles. And then that brings up another question. How many of these examples do you need to keep for, uh, for the collection? Or can we share them around with other heritage groups? Or this is something we're still working on at the museum. Some other interesting bits and pieces that came from that collection. Um, up here we have you, what you expect, the ink bottles, uh, the photo below. It's just, we kept a number of the uh, necks and finishes from various medicine bottles that were there. Two very interesting pieces are these uh, seal, glass seals that would have been on uh, a half gallon bottle. And it's Victoria Regina. So that tells us the Royal Jubilee Hospital and the Royal Navy were collaborating and they were used, stuff was being sent over from the Navy. We suspect uh, these bottles contained laudanum and that's why they went to all the extra trouble to seal them with these we seal. So again, we start weaving stories um, that we wouldn't have otherwise known without finding these fragments. So I included what this VR bottle, I have, uh, I found a, a, a whole example just to show what it would have looked like. And a few of these have actually turned up around Victoria and they, the Royal, the, the Admiralty would have reused these. So they, they're not that common unless they were broken or somehow packed off with um, two, of, two of these bottles, the other two that you're showing came from uh, dredging of Esquimalt Harbor, recent, recent finds. They are both marked with the broad arrow. Um, the Admiralty Royal Navy did provide medicines. They were meant to be refilled and so not brought back and not basically thrown overboard. Uh, the blue um, was used from about the beginning of, uh, about the middle of the 19th century. And that was to indicate they're at hazardous products. Um, you had to have some caution if it indicated if it was blue, because with a lot of people being illiterate, they just kind of went to this color code. And they also, especially with poisonous material, they went to these bottles that had ridges and something of very that you would feel. And you can imagine. Uh, a Royal Navy ship in the middle of battle and dark and the surgeon grabbing, he would want to know, you know, if he's got the wrong bottle. The photo to the right there is a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, it's a book I worked on with uh, a couple of, with a Bermuda archaeologist. And we tried, we were working on documenting what was found. Uh, Bermuda, Bermuda had he, he, he found had an amazing collection of this material. And, and uh, we also have a fair bit from Esquimalt Harbor. So Esquimalt Harbor has also given us some interesting uh, artifacts that talk of global expansion. And Victoria was obviously being connected to the rest of the world with people coming and going, and it shows in the, the items that were left behind. The, uh, the pottery bottles from London Dairy, which you can see there. The, the next bottle is one of my favorite finds so far from Esquimalt Harbor, and it's from Tanga, Tanzania. And that uh, has a whole history in itself, uh, probably from the time of the First World War, when Britain attacked uh, the German held territories, Tanga, and it resulted in the Battle of the Bees. And there's a whole, we can weave a whole story around that. The next bottle there is from uh, Honolulu. Uh, that's Hawaiian territory. Um, the two egg shaped bottles at the bottom, one is from Schweppes, London. And these bottles uh, were designed by a fellow by the name of Hamilton. 
originally for Schweppes so that they would hold the pressure. They'd be laid on their sides so the corks would uh, remain wet and keep the carbonation. The one to the right of that is actually from Melbourne, Australia. So all of these items have come off the bottom of a scrambled harbor. Each one has a story. Okay, so bottles of uh, Asian origin, we certainly do find those. Um, this uh, brown stoneware, uh, brown glazed Chinese, so it's a soy pot. Uh, this was found in the Johnson Street Bridge extension. Um, this little Chinese glass medicine, that came from the historic Songhees village. So that's giving us some indication that the Songhees people were interacting with the Chinese community. And that's uh, areas where we don't have a lot of things written. So we really have to rely on the items that we're finding in the ground to tell us that those stories. The one on the right is another dredged item from the Squamalt Harbor. It is a Chinese beer. It could date as late as about the First World War. And that gives us a whole link into the possibility that this may be linked to the 85,000 Chinese that came through Esquimalt, William Head, on their way to World War I. Um, this is a story that's really not that well known, but we are finding some of these Chinese items in Esquimalt Harbor. So tableware and other glass objects, um, the top left here, these are uh, these were from the Royal Jubilee Hospital, and they're these beautiful green colored, and they're syringe plungers. And we did find some reference to these that uh, they were potentially for uh, mercury injections. And that was a treatment that for syphilis, of course. And, uh, you know, the old adage, you know, an hour with Venus and a lifetime with Mercury. So again, that opens up possibilities, lots of other stories. Uh, these milk glass canning jar seals were also from the Royal Jubilee Hospital. And that's telling us that they were likely doing home, they were using home canning uh, for a lot of stuff. So people may have been bringing stuff to the hospital or uh, the lower corner here, that's a, a glass, a bottom of a drinking glass from the Songhees village. This very fancy uh, fluted champagne glass also from the Songhees village. And we get lots of pieces of, uh, of lighting lampshades. These were fairly fragile and broken. So fragments of uh, ceramics, that's a whole different area. Um, after bottles, it's ceramic fragments are what you're going to typically find. And those are almost always just fragments with some exceptions of the small storage jars. And I have some uh, photos of those. Um, they can offer very precise dates um, through registry numbers, potters, potters marks, and uh, even the designs. And day-to-day -day breakage, well, that happens, but every once in a while you get uh, events happen and you'll end up with a whole um, a amazing grouping of, of broken items. And uh, with, with ceramics, you have to always be careful that there's, there could be a very long lag time between when it's deposited and when it was purchased or originally used. Uh, this sort of thing, well, that was my grandmother's, you know, dish, you just broke it, and well, it gets thrown out, but it, it could be a 50 year span. The photo at the top is of, um, it's called spongeware. This was from the historic Songhees village and probably Scottish origin. And it was, they say, they seem to have a liking for this material and, and it is actually quite pretty. Uh, this, the photo at the bottom, 
is from the Royal Jubilee Hospital, uh, all this transfer wear pink uh, design. And it's almost as if there was a cart crashed and a whole bunch of stuff broke at once because it was all grouped together. And other types of, of, of pottery, we, uh, this, this one here, we actually, this is from the Songhees, historic Songhees village. We pieced this together from, it was, took a little bit of work, but we found quite a few of the pieces and we put, assembled the potter's mark, uh, which actually gave us a very precise date of when this was registered. So it couldn't have been used before this date. And this registry mark dated out to January 21st, 1881. And we have a further indication of the date because it has England here. And in 1890, the US Tariff Act required the country of origin. So we know this was probably made after 1890 and it would have been deposited before 1911 when the, uh, the Sanghees moved from the village. Another one from the Sanghees village is uh, this mocha ware, and this seemed to be another favorite item. Um, and this is where they uh, would drop a little bit of acid on the, uh, on, on, in the glaze and would form this dendritic kind of seaweed uh, look. It's actually really amazing stuff. Other ones that are very obvious, these are two that uh, have just been dredged from a squamalt harbor. Uh, quite obviously, Royal Navy. These would have been private purchase. Uh, members of a mess would have got together and they would have bought their plates for their mess. Uh, the Admiralty wasn't that, uh, they were kind of cheap, so you, you could buy your own dishes. And they would order them with the mess number on it. Now, the interesting thing about these two plates, um, both of them looked as if they'd been uh, cut to make to form a, a plaque and when i talked to some archaeologists in bermuda they had found similar things so you would expect it, if it had broken naturally there you know this this wouldn't be intact in the middle it's it's been chiseled away so again another uh, another story uh, what were they doing with this you know why were they doing this and uh, these plates are extremely rare items. As I had mentioned before, some of these ceramics that we find intact are the small little jars and uh, containers. And these four are all from the Royal Jubilee Hospital. They are tooth, well, tooth powder. And this one here with Queen Victoria, it is actually a, a gorgeous piece. It's with gold trim and, and full color, and uh, it likely was an expensive item. The next one here, the, the cherry toothpaste, this is Lyman's from Montreal. And certainly by 1890-93, we have uh, stuff coming across by train. So we start to see a lot of stuff from Eastern Canada. The two cold cream jars, uh, because they don't have a company, they may well have been uh, purchased by local pharmacies uh, and made their own cold cream and, and, and sold it. The uh, photo on the right came from the historic Sanghees village, uh, Lowe and Son perfumers to her, their majesty's London. This would have been likely an expensive little item and uh, was obviously could have been a prized item by somebody in the Songhees village. Uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, ceramics. Uh, the Royal Jubilee Hospital offered us an amazing opportunity to look at some of the early Japanese material that was being brought in. We know we got this down, as I said, to a three year period. And these beautiful little pieces, uh, certainly it was becoming popular uh, to buy these as gift where I suspect somebody had taken them to the hospital and somehow it fell off the desk or uh, fell off their tray and it got broken. So we have quite a number of examples of these and uh, 
we have nowhere else do we have items that we can date like that that closely. The, these two items were both from the Songhees village. This is a fragment of a double happiness uh, Chinese rice bowl and a blue and white uh, lid from a, from a ginger pot. So again, that tells us that the Songhees people were likely interacting with the Chinese community and, and shopping in, in their shops and, and vice versa. Clay pipes, um, that is another common find we, we have, um, especially mid 19th century, by the end of the 1800s, briar pipes had pretty much replaced them. Um, this one with the anchor is right out of Esquimalt Harbor, and it's obvious that uh, the, the symbolic, you know, anchor on there. Um, these pipes, there, there are literally thousands and thousands of different pipes. They were ubiquitous. Uh, they were made by all kinds of people. They have uh, benevolent or benevolent organizations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this one was from the, with the Eagle Claw, that was from the Sanghees, uh, historic Sanghees village. And you can see where that might well have appealed to, uh, to a First Nations person. And this one is also from the uh, Sanghees village. It just says TD, which stood for Thomas Dormer, which was the style of pipe. Probably your, you know, your box stock, cheapest pipe, but. And we can look at metals. Um, they, they make up another large component of uh, historic sites. Um, typically very highly corroded, and that includes things, scrap, metal, tools, wagon, car parts, barrel hoops, wire. Um, and a lot of this can, stuff can be very large. Uh, Non-ferrous objects typically are less common uh, because they were recycled, but they can be some really interesting items. And typically brass lamp burners, door hardware, decorative objects. And certainly a special interest uh, would be the coins, badges, medallions, buttons. And we certainly do see items like that. A lot of those would have been uh, frequently lost items as opposed to discarded. And that photo on the right there is from the Royal Jubilee Hospital. It is one of their sad irons, like the solid iron, iron. And uh, if you wanted to actually, there'd be a lot of conservation work if you wanted that for uh, to be cleaned up for to display. Other metal items, um, the top there, um, these are all safety pins from the Royal Jubilee Hospital. Uh, it was kind of an interesting find that we kept finding these, but uh, then the lamp burners, um, these are all from the, the the Jubilee Hospital. So if a lamp was broken, they frequently would just, the burner would just get tossed. Uh, we have an tour tourniquet uh, that was for some reason discarded. Uh, I found references to these from the Civil War, very similar ones. So we know it was used, they were using them at the Jubilee. And this was uh, a little 1888 five cent coin that we found in the, in the material at uh, the Jubilee accidentally thrown out with with other material and i did a calculation and it's worth about a dollar fifty in today's money or the equivalent so it's kind of like losing a toonie um down here we have brass cartridges uh gun cartridges these can give very precise datings as well these head stamps this is uh, winchester repeating arms this is from the Songhees village and we know that was introduced in 1886. Another one from Esquimal Harbor that uh, I found really interesting, and it's just a key and a tag, a skeleton key, but it's marked RDF. Well, it took me a little bit to figure this out, but I went to the Dictionary of Military Abbreviations for the Commonwealth, and it turns out it was the Radio Detection Finding Office. And that in 1940 became radar. And any country that had that, it was 
very secret. It was the cutting edge of technology. So this key would have been important to somebody, but it also, it opens up this whole story of uh, looking at it from, from a technological point of view, you know, and, and radar it was being used. As I'd mentioned, buttons. Uh, this is another find from a scrambled harbor, Royal Engineers, and this can offer us some very uh, precise dates as well. Of course, it has VR on there for Victoria Regina, and the back stamps can give us a lot of information. Um, this was Furman, and we know this was uh, made after 1879. So it was likely one of the Royal Engineers that were here uh, working on our coastal defenses. <clears throat> that brings us to perishable materials. Um, so a lot of, uh, certainly in, in historic 19th century, 18th, 19th century, there was, uh, you know, plastics in that were pretty much non-existent. So a lot of the stuff just deteriorated and very little of that exists. But when we do find uh, perishable material, it's either in a very wet or dry condition. Uh, things like uh, leather usually lasted. And uh, all of that, if, you, if it is found, it needs a lot of conservation. The photo to the right is um, a bentwood box and on the shutter site that I talked about, which was a building site within the Songhees village, there was a cistern that would remain full of water and it was filled with uh, amazing artifacts. There were shoes, there was bent, or, uh, halibut hooks, cordage, baskets. All of the stuff uh, was certainly uh, treated and, and preserved. Um, as I mentioned, leather tends to preserve. This is one of the shoes that were from that cistern. So it gives us an idea of the footwear that uh, were being worn by the Songhees. And the other two here uh, were from the Johnson Street Bridge approach. So there's a woman's shoe and a, and a part of a man's shoe. But leather certainly does last. As I mentioned, uh, there was a halibut hook found in that uh, cistern, and this is a drawing of it. Uh, very, very rare to find this sort of thing. And we were so lucky that we preserved this site. As I'd mentioned earlier, it was just one uh, bone all that archaeology branch determined uh, was pre-contact. So that triggered the, the whole work at the site. I would say probably 80 to 90% of the entire Sanghees village was bulldozed with no assessment. And again, perishable objects. Um, this is another find from Esquimalt Harbor. It's a wooden fid that would have been used for uh, splicing rope and probably dropped overboard from while well, someone was working on it. Uh, the photo to the right here. Every once in a while with the right conditions, paper will uh, preserve. And it's something if it's found, you really have to get a photo of it fairly quick. And this is uh, French capers. And again, this was in the Royal Jubilee Hospital. Personal items. Um, certainly we find bits and pieces of, of, of this stuff. Uh, the photo there to the right is a blue uh, trade bead. Uh, it's typically called a Russian, Russian blue facet. If this is probably one of the most favorite beads that were traded uh, on the coast. And this one is from the Sanghees village. Another one I, we found in the village uh, was this Gouda Percha comb. And first look, it's, it's a plastic item, but no, it really is uh, an older piece. And Gouda Percha was, it was a polymer and it dates back to 1842. So we, do have some plastics and in, in the synthetic materials that do show up. And again, some personal items. Uh, these are some favorites of mine. Uh, the badge here uh, on the left was from the Royal Jubilee Hospital. 
I haven't identified it completely, but it's probably Ottoman Empire, Turkish, and it's obviously uh, from a sailor who was likely being treated at the Royal Jubilee Hospital. So that opens up some interesting connections. The uh, next badge was found at the approach to Johnson Street Bridge on the west side. So it was in the Songhees uh, village and it's a patriotic Civil War badge, the Union badge. Took me a while to get this identified, but it was nice that uh, the folks in Alexandria, Virginia, they have the Museum of Archaeology she identified it finally, and uh, it's been found in other sites throughout the US. So that gives us an idea that the Songhees were having some contact with the San Juan, and of course that brings us into the Pig War and, and lots of other things. Other personal items, uh, the one here uh, to the right, that was actually found on the Songhees village, and it's more it's stamped Moore and Company, Victoria with the Royal Crest here. And he was a very early uh, chemist in Victoria. So one of the really neat finds from Musquamalt Harbor was this telescope. A uh, little bit damaged probably from the dredging, but it is signed Bertram Chambers. Uh, Ross London was the maker. Be a telescope uh, of, you know, of, of the watch or like uh, for, for, for the person on watch. We would guess that this would be something that his family might have purchased him when he was given his commission. So we started digging a little bit and lo and behold, we found him and we found lots on him. And he was a midshipman here in uh, the 1880s on the HMS satellite. And he went on to become a full admiral. He won the Order of the Bath in I was awarded in 1919 for his organizing of uh, convoys from Halifax in World War One, and I was at the uh, Naden Museum um, a couple months ago, and lo and behold, there is his log, Bertram Chambers' uh, HMS satellite, and there is probably a uh, an entry in there about him losing his telescope overboard. So other materials, uh, there's lots of other materials that we do find, uh, everything from bone, stone, concrete, mortar, bricks. Bricks are a study all of themselves. Um, ivory, tortoiseshell, horn. Oh, um, as I mentioned, gutta percha. Gun flints are another thing that we do find. Um, this photo on the right is a very interesting piece. Uh, Grant has run, written a spe specific article on the, these finds. This is part of an argillite plate, and it was probably broken while it was being carved. We found this at the uh, the uh, Haida village site, Haida campsite at Lime Bay, and we have found other pieces around Victoria. And it's so something that would be very easily missed because it just looks on the backside just looks like a black stone, but it tells us that the Haida were bringing this material down and probably working on it on site. As I mentioned, uh, children's artifacts, we certainly, that's an underrepresented uh, group, certainly in the written history, typically. Um, uh, the upper photos, uh, these, these are all from the uh, Songhees village. Um, the rest of them are from the Royal Jubilee Hospital. <coughs> and we don't find a lot of children's toys, but certainly the marbles and dolls' heads and ceramic items are, are found. And there's a little whistle there. <coughs> Pardon me. It's um, kind of sad to think that why some of these children's toys would have been thrown out at the at the Royal Jubilee Hospital, but that's another story that we may never know. And bone and faunal material, certainly that shows up, and that gives us a, a lot of in ideas on what people were eating, what cuts they were having. You know, it gives an idea of, uh, well, people's dietary habits. This uh, photo on the right 
is uh, one of my favorites. And these were found in Esquimalt Harbor, and these are tropical turtle bones, which Grant got really excited. I didn't know what they were. Grant Keddy was with me at the time, and he got really excited. And they did, in fact, capture uh, sea turtles, hold them in the in the. They would be held in the in the, in the ship or in the in the hull. And uh, they'd be kept until they were eaten because they had very slow metabolism. And uh, apparently they were quite good. They were, it said they were cross between crab and beef. So I would imagine they'd be quite a treat uh, for the crew to have turtle soup. So in summary, the fragments beneath our feet can tell us much of our history. And al although uh, the conservation Heritage Conservation Act has a mixed, has a fixed date of 1846, um, local governments, historic groups, and even the collector community can encourage that historic archaeological mater material is salvaged. And uh, redevelopment is certainly going on at a fast pace and it will continue and it's impossible to save everything, but we really have to decide what is significant at the local, provincial, national, or even global level. And the global level, things like Esquimalt Harbor, I consider that's kind of global level because it's so much world history. And we need to share that information with the public. Uh, and answer the uh, basically the who cares question. And we do that by getting that information out there. Uh, the photo on the right is a poster from uh, Point Ellis House. That's uh, for their archaeology day. They will be holding that again this year, which is kind of exciting. The first two years they did it, it was fairly well attended. And uh, that gets a lot of the archaeological groups and, and heritage groups together, and people can bring things and discuss anything they want about archaeology. And public programs and engagement. Now, this was a really, really fun project that I was involved in at the museum. The University of Victoria, uh, they had a historic archaeology course. Um, it was offered for a couple of years. And they came and said, well, what collections do you have? And we offered up, the first year we offered up the uh, Royal Jubilee Hospital collection. And each of the students took an aspect of that collection and researched it on what, what, it, what it meant, what was significant. And their project was to develop a one day pop-up exhibit for the public and we held that at the museum and to talk about those artifacts and what they meant and what the memories were and the historic area of information behind it. And there's just a, a few photos they, they had some of the plates here, this is blue willow wear and some of the posters. And it was really well attended and they did it a second year with the Johnson Street Bridge material. So, this is kind of getting the public interested. And another one here, uh, it shows, uh, this, this was our work, some of the work we were doing at uh, Craig Flower Manor, where we had done a collection of uh, intertidal material. And this is Genevieve Hill, uh, with some volunteers working on, we were recording this material that was found. And this is a piece that was before we picked it up in the mud. And that's uh, Japanese Phoenix ware. So it was something that was probably used uh, at, at, the, at the farm and ended up as a broken piece on the beach. So I'll leave that there. Um, for potential questions. Uh, this is a photo I took last year. This is Grant Keddy and uh, we were out at the zero tide at Esquimalt Harbor and looking to see what we could find in terms of fragments of history. So I will leave that open for questions. <laughs>